Well, when the invitation came to speak today on early mathematical instruments, my first thought was that uh, the early Royal Society didn't have very much interest in mathematical instruments in the well-established meaning of the term in the 17th century. This was the Royal Society of London for the improvement of natural knowledge, which was not the same thing. But then I thought, well, I have only 25 minutes towards the end of the day, so the audience <laughs> might not be too devastated if there isn't a great deal to say. <laughs> and then, a bit more positively, well, there might be more to say than I imagine at first, and even the relative lack of interest in an area that we might think of as central to science and its history could itself be significant. So I better explain what I mean. First, then, what was meant by mathematical instruments in the 17th century? A term with a much longer pedigree than experimental natural philosophy. That was a relative newcomer. In fact, a very newcomer. Very, very new as a comer. The Royal Society was, was certainly interested in instruments, but mainly the new fine gold optical instruments, the telescopes and the microscopes, and the even more recently fangled instruments of natural philosophy, uh, such as air pumps and electrical machines. Mathematical instruments were much older, with an active tradition of writing and publishing, as well as making and large numbers of specialist craftsmen in manufacturing centres regulated by guilds and companies and so on, so sufficiently established for all of that uh, commercial and regu regulatory apparatus. Optical instruments and instruments of natural philosophy could be used for making discoveries about the natural world, making experimental investigations that might yield new natural knowledge. Mathematical instruments had no such ambitions. They were for solving problems that were amenable to mathematical techniques, especially geometry, for finding the time or the positions of the planets, for surveying land, for drawing a map, for navigating a ship, for designing a building, for finding the distance of an artillery target and setting the charge and the inclination of the gun to hit it, and so on. Many fields of application had been developed for instruments such as sundials, astrolabes, quadrants, theodolites, maps, globes, rangefinders, inclinometers, and so on and so on. But they did not interfere with natural philosophy. While this was a limitation to their competence, it was also a source of freedom in their design and use. They did not need to conform to the strictures of natural philosophy. Now my favorite example of this is that terrestrial globes rotate on polar axes before Copernicus proposes, 1543, that the Earth might be doing the same thing. So you get globes that rotate, just as the Earth is supposed to do, before anyone in, in cosmology thinks that might be happening. Now these globes do not represent anticipations or precursors of the Copernican system of the world, they simply offer a convenient device for uh, dealing with calculations relating time and date and geographical position. So they're useful. It's useful that they rotate. It doesn't have any implications about the way the world is. A characteristic element in contemporary practical mathematics, the place where you find these mathematical instruments, was called the theoric. Now, that might not be a term that uh, is familiar to every, everyone here, so I'll explain it as best I can. It's a term of art that's used in the, in the period. A theoric was an encapsulation of information secured by a systematic technique, usually a geometrical one, in a device that might be an instrument but could be a diagram or a construction, or the rules for constructing uh, a, a, a diagram. Results could be obtained from the theoric that were not entered in its construction and that were extracted 
by the operation of proper protocols by the knowing user. The example most familiar to historians, historians of science, is the theoric of planetary motion. You've all probably heard about deference circles, epicycles, and so on, the, uh, equant circles. The way you calculate planetary positions, that's a theoric. That's the one that historians of science uh, have generally uh, heard about. So it's a geometrical construction using combinations of circles for predicting or retrodicting planetary positions. But mathematical practice has many other in different disciplines, much more un not nearly so fashionable among historians of science today. As the vehicle for an operative technique rather than a causal explanation, the theoric belongs in the mathematical arts and sciences rather than in natural philosophy. It does not make the epistemological claims of natural philosophy regarding the true understanding of nature. The geometrical cartography of the 16th century, for example, offered world maps that took a variety of forms, different shapes, shaped by different geometrical projections. And these varieties could coexist. It wasn't a matter of which one of these is true. That wasn't the point uh, of, of these theorics that we call maps. They were to be deployed according to their suitability for different purposes. Now, keeping in mind that contemporary meaning, that meaning in the period of mathematical instrument, we will not find much of relevance in the early deliberations of the Royal Society. So, it might look as if I don't have a subject. Well, it wasn't my subject. I was given it by the organizers. So, I thought I'd better take it on. <laughs> we can be sure that certain mathematical instrument makers were known to certain fellows. A little bit of a discussion of that just a moment ago. We know, for example, of Hook and Wren employing some of them. Another example would be that in bringing Oldenburg up to date with news of plague-ridden London in 1665, Robert Murray, or Murray wrote as follows, We are here much troubled with the loss of poor Thompson and Sutton. Now, they were two mathematical instrument makers in London, very well-known ones. Anthony Thompson, Henry Sutton, two of the capital's finest mathematical instrument makers who died uh, in the plague. In fact, I want just to show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. I want to take this opportunity to demonstrate just how outstandingly good the best of the London makers uh, could be at their trade. Henry Sutton was one of the most original among these makers, one with significant interests in geometry and new designs. And he may also have been the finest engraver uh, in the city when the Royal Society was founded. Now, over in the museum, uh, where, as you heard, I work, Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, we have a universal astrolabe, as it's called. That's an astrolabe which uh, uh, projects the whole of the celestial sphere in one plate. If you know about astrolabes, you don't need different latitude plates. Don't worry about that. The, the, uh, a universal astrolabe by Sutton. And, but also, very unusually, we have a, an early pool taken directly from that astrolabe. So, in other words, someone has inked it and put it in a press or, and, and, and printed it. So printed directly from the astrolabe. So uh, there it is. Now we've been struggling a little bit with the lights and, uh, and uh, seeing the images and so on. I really want you to have a look at this. So on, the, on the left, you have the instrument, this astrolabe. And on the right, you have, a, as I say, an early pool. We can tell that it's, it's, it's early. It's contemporary, more or less, with the instrument taken directly from, from the instrument. Um, and you might think, you know, what's that for? What's that print? It's in reverse, of course. So you, not, not a lot you can do with it. It's, uh, it's, back, it's back to front because it has been uh, uh, engraved uh, directly. Why was it made? And different possibilities have been uh, suggested. It's a close-up, a part of it. What immediately strikes you, I would say, when you're looking at this print is its extraordinary quality. To pull such a print from so complicated an instrument seems to me an act of bravado. I mean, look at it. It's extraordinary. Uh, an assertion of self-confidence in outstanding skills. 
any untidiness or unevenness of line that may not be obvious on the brass surface when you look at it would immediately be revealed by the print. But look at it. It's extraordinary. It's amazing. It's done by hand. Okay? And this, of course, is a magnification of it. Amazing. I and mean, it is really extra. I shouldn't go on, but it is extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> and this is fairly early as regards printing from copper plates in England. Um, Sutton is saying he's as good as any of these contemporary uh, engravers. There may be some leeway in a figurative print, uh, print you know, if you have a, an, an image of a, of, a, of a landscape or a portrait or something like that. But there's nowhere to hide here, nowhere to hide any faults in a detailed projection like this. It's going to, you're all going to be able to see it immediately if there's anything wrong. I can't see anything wrong. So mathematical instrument making, I don't know if that's my last one. Well, you can see it. Uh, that's not, it's, a, it's a signature. Henricus uh, Sutton, of course, it's back to front down the bottom. There. So mathematical instrument making has reached an impressive level of skill in the 17th century. The English and, and uh, English mathematicians and instrument makers are introducing innovative and successful designs, some of which I'll mention later, as well as cultivating manual skill. But this is not a discipline much in evidence at the Royal Society. So there's this other parallel uh, technical story. Uh, which doesn't really bother the society very much. Searching the early, you know, trying to find something to say, searching the early volumes of the uh, Philosophical Transactions, I, I found one article on a mathematical instrument in the, contem in the sense of the period, uh, and it was by, uh, oh, sorry, I had another one. I just couldn't stop myself. Look at that. <laughs> where, the, where the projection insists, because of the nature of the projection, that the, that the lines get, get closer and closer together towards the edge. You know, Sutton can still, still do that. Sorry, I forgot my head. Anyway, uh, the, the one, the one uh, mathematical <laughs> instrument in the Phil Trans was indeed by an alumnus of this college, of whom you've heard already. Uh, on the left-hand side there, this is uh, Christopher Wren's perspectograph. Um, it's, a, it's a, an instrument for, for drawing in perspective. Uh, so you trace, you, you, you put your eye at A and you, 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 you trace uh, around the scene and, and mechanically it's drawn on a, a, a vertical piece of, a piece of paper on that vertical uh, drawing board. It's known to the mathematical instrument maker, uh, Ralph Greatrix. In fact, it's in the, 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 the Hartlip uh, record. It's attributed to Wren as early as uh, uh, 1653. Wren described it to Greater X. Uh, he had one made by Anthony Thompson, the other person who uh, uh, Murray mentions died in the plague. Um, Oldenburg had one who's come up. Pepys has come up uh, already today. Pepys had one. Boyle had one. Yes, so so, so the, the, clearly this was a, a must-have uh, thing for the, for the group of people we're, uh, we're talking about. Um, and there was, and indeed, also, the other, not a person who had one, but has come up, the Royal Society's Museum had one. So the repository uh, in that, uh, that catalogue by Gru that you saw earlier, there's a Wren perspectograph. That Wren provides the instance uh, where we can recover a, a link between mathematical instruments and the Wadham Gresham Royal Society nexus is typical of him. His engagement with practical mathematics remained distinctive from his early interest in sundials. Through his activities in drawing, instrument design, geometrical astronomy, machines, surveying instruments, and so on. By the mid-1660s, it was far from clear, it seems to me, that all the promise of this precocious, uh, of his precocious youth was going to lead to any lasting and substantial achievement. Until, of course, the architectural opportunities that came to him after the fire of London so closely matched and engaged the range of his practical mathematical talent. Hooke, of course, was the other figure whose mathematical, practical mathematical interests and skills could be turned to good effect in rebuilding London. Through his commitment, uh, sorry, though his commitment to uh, uh, experimental natural philosophy alongside practical mathematics was profound and, and sustained. 
On the mathematical instrument side, HOOK designed surveying, navigational, and astronomical measuring instruments. But even two swallows don't make a summer, and we must return to the fact that mathematical instruments, for all their development and significance in the 16th and 17th centuries, were not prominent in the work of the Royal Society. This had emphatically not always been the case for Gresham College and its mathematical professors. For the early predecessors of Hooke and Wren in Gresham mathematical chairs uh, had been very uh, interested in such developments. Wren certainly was aware of these precedents, saying in his inaugural address that you've heard uh, about a couple of times already today at Gresham in 1657, that the early professors had been says Wren, men of the most eminent abilities, especially in mathematical sciences, among whom the names of Gunter, Brerwood, Gellibrand, and Foster are fresh in the mouths of all mathematicians. Now, he said that, obviously, for a Gresham audience, um, but still, there was truth to it as well. The reputations of these men were certainly in practical mathematics and mathematical instruments. Perhaps Edmund Gunter, most of all, uh, as we heard uh, Professor Briggs has left, I gather, but uh, he mentioned uh, Gunter's uh, uh, fame in uh, the uh, design of uh, introduction, invention of mathematical instruments. Um, here's a Gunter sector. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think, it's, I think it's one of ours at the Museum of the History of Science. They all look much the same uh, by, by Elias Allen. Uh, they were quite common. Uh, so this is a Gunter sector. Um, it's, a, it's an instrument for calculation. Uh, you, you have sets, pairs of, uh, of, of lines uh, with, uh, drawn out according to different functions depending on the functionality of the instrument. But you can imagine if you just have ordinary equally spaced lines, you can open the, uh, tri the uh, arms of this uh, sector to whatever angle is appropriate to the kind of ratio you're working with. And then with a pair of dividers, you can just take off uh, 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 distances to scale. Supposing you're drawing a, a plan to scale, then this gives you uh, the individual uh, 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 distances, lengths that you need, without having to do any proportional calculations. The instrument does it for you. So it becomes very popular. Um, you saw uh, Professor Briggs showed another version of this, um, of this, this uh, uh, illustration. These are the two sides of the same instrument. Um, this is an engraving by the instrument maker Elias Allen uh, of, of Gunter Sector, which becomes, as I say, a very common instrument. And Gunter Sector is a development of, uh, I mean, lots of people had sectors, a sector type of instruments in the, in the 16th century and the early 17th century, most famously Galileo. But, but Gunter Sector has particular lines on it which are used for navigation. So he, he uh, develops a, a, a variant of the instrument which is appropriate to the the, the trigonometrical calculations required for Mercator sailing, for sailing using a Mercator chart. And in his book, he explains how to use the instrument to do that. It's a little, Mercator sailing is rather complicated, uh, and, uh, but, but Gunter uh, develops this instrument, which, which, as I say, becomes very popular and, uh, and writes a book about how to do it. So the sector, the typical mathematical instrument, uh, and uh, there's a chap, in fact, these are just two bits of uh, illustration from... Um, from uh, one of Gunter's books, the chap on the, on the left is using his sector with his pair of dividers uh, to do his calculation. The chap on the right, you can see, has a, has a cross staff, and you might not think that that's particularly original with Gunther, but it is, in fact, uh, an illustration of Gunther's rule. And Gunther's rule was a very important instrument indeed, probably in the long run, certainly in the long run, more important than Gunther's sector, but it was originally engraved on, the, on a cross staff because it was so particularly uh, uh, adapted to, uh, to navigational calculations. So you'd have your cross staff and then you'd have the, the, the lines of the Gunter rule on the cross staff itself. And, and so that's why the chap on the right is with his left hand. He, he's indicating the other use of the Gunter rule. He has his dividers and he has a rule. The Gunter rule is, is a logarithmic rule. So it ha it's, 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 it's doing the same kind of calculations as a sector, but now using Napier's logarithms that so enchanted uh, Professor Briggs, as we heard uh, earlier uh, uh, today. So Gunther uh, uh, applies that uh, mathematical technology directly to uh, the calculations required by uh, Siemens. 
with log trig scales on his road. Uh, and of course, it's only one step from that, instead of using dividers to have two roads sliding across each other, and you have a technology that sustains so much of practical mathematics until, what, 1972 or something like that, uh, when, when you, know, you get a lot of uh, pocket calculators. But right until then, Gunther's technology in this tradition of mathematical instruments is doing the business in so many uh, professions where uh, calculations are required. The other instrument that's very, very common through the 17th, 18th century is Gunter's sector, which is a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, 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 it's for telling the time, but also for doing a variety of uh, uh, astronomical calculations. And I just show you a couple of, of examples. We haven't time to think about it. But the one on the bottom left was made in Oxford by Prugene, so uh, an instrument maker in Oxford. Okay. And then Samuel Foster, too, was, pre, uh, was preoccupied with instrument design, sundials, improved quadrants, calculating instruments, and so on. I might have something that just gestures towards uh, uh, Foster's, Foster's interests. So in the early, uh, the early uh, professors of the, of the, uh, uh, at Gresham College were, were very much engaged with this, this other, other tradition of instrumentation, this much longer tradition that I was invited to talk about, the tradition of mathematical instruments. If we focus on the early Royal Society group moving through the uh, Wadham College period in the familiar narrative, we see a shift in emphasis from practical mathematics that we've seen just now to experimental natural philosophy and from a concern with developing sectors and quadrants to the invention, improvement and employment of telescopes, microscopes, barometers and air pumps. This development is a connected narrative, not an arbitrary sequence. I mean, there's, there's meaning to it. There's a, there's, a, there's a sense and a purpose to it. The problems confronted by the new philosophy were inherited from the inadequacies and dilemmas of the old. The ambitions and agendas of the new philosophy were influenced by visionary, pragmatic thinkers. But the, qu the qualities and characteristics of practical mathematics were an important resource for the emerging experimental mechanical philosophy. So this, what I'm saying is that this mathematical, this practical mathematical tradition feeds, provides a resource for the new experimental philosophy, even though it isn't part of that philosophy itself. So, uh, a resource for the emerging experimental mechanical philosophy. There is the kind of things that it, it brings to the table are mathematics as a tool of uh, synthesis, mechanics as a paradigm mode of causal operation in the natural world, the natural world as well as in the artificial one where we've seen. Manipulative, operative knowledge as a resource for the experimental approach to natural philosophy. And instruments as the tools and embodiment of this experimental engagement with nature. The story of Gresham College itself from the practical achievements of Gunter to the experimental philosophy of Hooke is an institutional strand in the same narrative. As early as the mid-1640s uh, when Foster was still in post and John Wallace, as we've heard, was becoming involved, what Wallace remembers being discussed are the circulation of the blood, valves in the veins, the Copernican hypothesis, the nature of new comets and so on, the familiar, I think, uh, list that many of you will know phases of Venus, improvement of telescopes, the weight of the air again, as we've heard, the impossibility of vacuities, the Torricelli and experiment in Quicksilver. Wallace gives this list where, there is, where mathematics is there, but there's a very strong shift already in the uh, 1640s towards natural philosophy. When Wren writes from Wadham College in February, taking it uh, forward another decade, February uh, 1656, probably to William Petty, giving him what he calls philosophical news. He says in his letter, I'll tell you the philosophical news. His dioptrical work includes the anatomy of the, anatomy of the eye alongside the improvement of microscopes and telescopes. He reports a micrometric survey of the moon, which involved adapting traditional measuring instruments to the astronomical telescope alongside a study of the Earth's magnetic variation, anatomical dissection where he's providing the drawings and experiments in intravenous injection. So again, you see the same uh, shift 
And the trend continues as the Royal Society institutionalizes an emphasis on natural knowledge. But of course, all the while, the world of, ma mathematical, instru continue, ma of mathematical instruments continues to develop and the English makers continue to improve and uh, flourish. We've seen the level of skill achieved by Henry Sutton. And new textbook writers emerge to explain how the instruments are used and the geometrical techniques uh, applied uh, to, to practical ends. We've seen, just seen in the, in the uh, who was it? It was you, Michael, showed a, a, a picture of William Leybourne, who's one of these uh, uh, characteristic authors in the mathematical tradition of towards the, in, in the later 17th century. You know, practitioners still need to find the latitude, the time, measure land, draw maps, and so on. You, you need only visit the museum, of, sorry, I'm plugging it so often. <laughs> you need only visit the Museum of the History of Science to see th that the material remains of science from the 17th century comprise quadrants, sundials, artillery and surveying instruments, sectors, rules, and slide rules, rather than air pumps and electrical machines. We don't have any air pumps from the 17th century. I mean, th there were air pumps in the 17th century, but they were very, very few. So the attrition rate that uh, yields the kind of profile of uh, material in, in museums means that we don't have any now. But we have lots of the much more uh, uh, common instruments of mathematics. The makers were operating successful businesses with workshops, reception spaces, even demonstration spaces they had, items in stock, items to order, and so on. Am I okay for just a... Okay. Indeed, when the Royal Society proposes to keep a stock of experiments, which, is in, a, which in, in effect means a collection of natural philosophical instruments, it's hard not to think that the instrument shop, as it was managed in the 17th century, was as much a model uh, as the very few collections that existed then of natural rarities. We see this, this development... Uh, happening in real time, so to speak, at a meeting of the Society in December 1673 when Hooke was showing an experiment on the relation between magnetic attraction and distance. And the, the uh, journal book says, upon this occasion, as say, prompted by Hooke's uh, uh, experiment, Sir William Petty, you've heard of him already, Sir William Petty moved that the Society would give orders that there might be a constant apparatus of instruments ready for the making of several kinds of experiments depending on several heads. For instance, for experiments of motion, optical, magnetical, electrical, mercurial, etc. And that such instruments as had formerly been used by the society and were out of order might be repaired and all these put together in a room by themselves to be ready upon occasion for strangers or for repetition and further prosecution of the several sorts of experiments. That's an extraordinary statement. I don't know if you, you know, had time to take that in. He's proposing just the kind of cabinet of physics that would become so popular among institutions in the 18th century and setting out its main divisions, you know, optical, magnetical, electrical, and so on. Uh, and, of course, the emphasis in this stock of instruments is very much in natural philosophy. He doesn't say, we'll have to have a, a cupboard for the astrolabes. You know, that's, uh, uh, even though the proposal is shaped by a former surveyor and designer of ships, you know, by Sir William Petty. But I want to conclude with just one residual instance of the methodology of practical mathematics, just to show that I'm coming back with, with something under my, in my mission uh, one instance of survival within the Royal Society. It does not concern an instrument directly, but a theory. Now, if you remember what that was from, from my introduction, the characteristic synthesizing tool of practical mathematics, and in fact, a theory that takes its form from an instrument in a kind of analogy, as you'll see. We have uh, seen that Wren was perhaps temperamentally and intellectually the, uh, and, and eventually, certainly professionally, engaged with practical mathematics and mathematical instruments. Wren had been active at Gresham College with his uh, colleague there, Lawrence Rook, again whom you've heard of, 
in experiments on the collision of bodies prior to a visit by Christian Huygens in 1661 when Huygens used his theory of elastic impact to predict correctly the results of their experiments. So Red and Hooke have done these experiments. Huygens comes along and says, well, if, you do the, if, if, if such and such are the incident velocities, this is what re results. And they look at him, yes, he's right. So. Um, this looks like an obvious candidate for a study in experimental natural philosophy. Wren and Hooke had, had used, they said, quote, balls of wood and other stuff hanging by threads. So, kind of familiar thing. Frames of just that sort were later included in standard cabinets of physics in the, in the 18th century. While the overall context for the discussion was the laws of impact enunciated by Descartes in his Principles of Philosophy. Mechanical impact was to be the basis of the Cartesian natural philosophy and the fundamental ingredient in its causal explanations. But Descartes' actual laws seemed very dubious and in need of correction. Wren formulated his own theory of impact soon afterwards, but the disappointment with it among his colleagues was understandable. They weren't used to being disappointed by Wren, but they were a bit put out by this theory. Everyone agreed that it predicted the experimental results and produced the same results as that of Huygens, but it seemed to lack the appropriate ambition in natural philosophy. Wren had stopped too soon at the formal expression of his results and did not go on to offer a demonstration or an explanation. When this was pointed out to him, Wren averred that he was finished, that that was it. That's all he planned to do. He is against, it was reported, it's a quotation, finding a reason for the ex experiments of motion and says that the appearances carry reason enough in themselves. Wren's theory would more properly have been called a theoric. It took the form of an analogy with the balance, with an ordinary balance, okay? Consider the bodies, inverted commas, we might say masses, but that would be anachronistic. Consider the bodies as the weights of the balance and their velocities as the distances of the respective weights from the fulcrum. Wren's analogy reduces all the experiments to only two general cases. One is when the balance is in equilibrium. The velocities are inversely proportional to the respective bodies. The center of gravity, using the analogy, coincides with the fulcrum of the balance. In that case, the velocities are unchanged after collision, says Wren, except that their directions are reversed. The collision is balanced in Wren's analogy. When it, where this is not the case, where velocities are not inversely proportional to the bodies and the center of gravity of the imagined balance does not coincide with the fulcrum, the situation after collision is, is represented by displacing the fulcrum to an equal distance on the other side of the center of gravity. That's it. That's Wren's account. Now, as with any theoric, this is a formalization of a set of observations that can be used to yield any number of results not included in the work of formulation. In that way, it's like a geometrical construction of planetary motion. I mean, before, before Kepler, not in the Keplerian sense. It's like a map drawn to scale or any number of mathematical instruments. In refusing to offer an explanation, Wren was, at that point, declining to go with the mainstream ambition of the Royal Society. As William Neal put it, for Dr. Wren, I think he assumes his axiom a great deal sooner than he need to do. To conclude that the appearance is the reality and that the appearance must not be denied to be really true under pretense that it is an axiom, methinks is not very philosophical. As I said, for that moment, Wren was not following the Royal Society into experimental philosophy, but he was in an older tradition among sectors, globes, astrolabes, and the great population of mathematical instruments. Thank you very much.